Hey, this is Mike McKenna. You're listening to the Chicago Singer Songwriter Podcast. Hey, this is Chris Dever, and you're listening to the Chicago Singer Songwriter Podcast. I'm here with Mike McKenna at my place in Pilsen. Mike, how are you tonight? I'm good. How are you, Chris? Good, man. Good. Cool. So, what's going on in your life right now? I uh, just, you know, working, man, and kind of hanging out, just doing my thing. Yeah, you yeah. got a, an album in the works. I do. Yeah, it uh, should be out uh, May first. Is kind of the date that we're looking at. Um, you know, going to be probably at Double Door. So, very hopefully cool. People can come check it out. Yeah, so before people go out and see you, they probably want to know a little bit about you. I, I mean, maybe. I don't, know <laughs> if, I don't know if they do or not. But um, So a little disclosure before we get into the, <laughs> the interview. It's the Chicago Singer Songwriter Podcast, but you don't live in the city of Chicago. I don't. No, I live in uh, Glen Ellen, which is a suburb just right outside of here. It's about 45 minutes away. Kind of like an up-and-coming area. I yeah, mean, it is. I mean, it's it's been that way for a while. Um, I definitely am from the other side of the tracks, though. I don't, you know, it's not really... I'm not amongst the norm over there, so... Like, and where we live and whatnot, so... Yeah, I know. I've got a buddy who lives in Wheaton. Um, yeah, that's where, where I, I was actually born and raised there. Oh, okay. So yeah. you know the area. Went to Wheaton so North. Rock on. West Sider. Yeah. Through. through. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, it just seems like 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 the Lombard area, and now I guess Wheaton's getting like a, a brewery and some yeah. cool shops next year. Yeah, Wheaton actually for the longest time you weren't actually able to like buy booze or like anything. Um, it used to be a, like a dry town. I think it actually still is a dry town, but um, certain bars have I guess you know laxed regulations and. Fucking Billy Graham, man. Fucking Billy Graham, dude. <laughs> you ever been to that place? He's got like this fucking room that has like a bunch of clouds in it and shit. No, I've dude. been. I went to the college for a concert like okay. years ago, but that's as close as I've been. Well, you to couldn't there. dance, could you? They don't let you dance or like hold hands or anything. They let you. It. There were pews. Like you got in and like you're sitting in pews. It was the most awkward like rock concert it's I've ever been to. Fucking Billy Graham, man. Yeah, fucking Billy Graham. Fucking Billy Graham. <laughs> <laughs> So how long have you, been, have you been playing music for? Um, I started actually like writing my own tunes when I was probably 23. Um, I had moved to Florida. My grandparents had died, and you know there was really I, I needed to get out, man. I mean, especially being from the suburbs, when you just feel like there is no escape from what you're supposed to do or what people are telling you to do, and so to just kind of pick up and get out of there is is the way to do it. You know, it's the way to truly like see what you're made of, kind of. So I just took my guitar, moved to Florida, just hung out on the beach for a few years, started a band, drank a lot of booze, <laughs> hung out, um, learned a lot of things too, though, you know, a lot more of appreciation for nature and things like that too. And it was like being and living by the beach really, it has this like uh, mystique about it, you know, kind of like makes you feel more in touch with nature and reality kind of thing. Yeah. You know? I mean, could have been the weed though too, who knows? <laughs> 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 Were you writing songs before you moved to Florida, or did you start when you moved out there? Not really. I used to, uh, believe it or not, I, I used to kind of be into the club scene a little bit, and I, I had taken up DJing as like a hobby. Um, one of my good friends, he, you know, got a resident spot over at a local club, and so I used to go all the time. And I started making my own stuff on uh, Fruity Loops, which is kind of like a music, you, you know, you're yeah, familiar with Loops, it, yeah. yeah. I mean, any, everybody, every, everybody's starting to make music knows Fruity Loops, so. Yeah, I mean, and then once, you know, the thing popped up on my screen and it says, hey, you got to buy this or else you can't use it anymore, that's kind of when I stopped using that program. Oh, interesting. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, not having money does that to you. So you went from, like, kind of producing music to making your own. What, yeah. Did your, did your musical taste change, like, in what you were listening to? Yeah, it did, because, you know, when you're, when you're young and stuff, you're quite impressionable on, like, what's going on around you, you know, and... Uh, but, you know, my sister is a couple of years older than me. And so when I started to get older and stuff, like when I was younger, I mean, she was listening to like Rage Against the Machine, Nirvana, you know, like things like that. And uh, when I got a little bit older and stuff, that kind of stuff fell into the background a little bit while, you know, the music scene, like the electronic music scene was pretty popular when I was 17, 18, things like that. But uh I don't know, once you feel confused and stuff, it, it almost seems like referring back to the Doors or the Beatles or, like, something like that really kind of helps you sort it out. You know, I mean, my parents are really big into that. So I used to hear it all the time on road trips and things like that, you know. The oldie station, you know, before they got bought out by some bullshit corporation. <laughs> <laughs> it was the good stuff. So just listening to that stuff that was more familiar kind of helped you connect 
yeah more to yourself and like figures i mean you, you go through different stuff as you get older and yeah you know i mean it's it's all about the vibe changes you know as you grow older and like you get into new scenes you get into new things um the vibe changes you know and sometimes um you know the music that you used to listen to just doesn't cut it anymore and so you need to either go back or you need to progress forward and listen to new stuff you know but i tend to find that the old stuff really is sinking in a lot harder the timeless stuff you know yeah, there's a reason they call it classics. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so when you were writing out there, um, you, you'd come home from Florida. Mm-hmm. Um, you had some songs in your belt. You were interested in, in pursuing music. Was it a career option at that point, or was it still a hobby? Uh, when I moved to Florida, like that kind of just gave me the idea and the belief that I, you could just do anything. You know, I mean, I came from here. So me going there with not really anything I knew two people that lived there or something like that. And I lived there for four years. You know, I started a band out there and we played all around all the big venues and things like that. And so I think, yeah, at that point, some point in Florida, it kind of took over on me and it was like, all right, this is just what you need to do. You know, when you wake up every single day and the only thing you can think of is playing music or writing music or like you just have all these fucking songs in your head and you just can't like, you know, get them out quick enough. I think that's kind of a sign like, hey, maybe you should do this. Florida, as compared to Chicago, yeah. What are what are some of the major differences you see? Between uh, the weather, the, <laughs> the weather. First off, I mean, there's there's a beach here too, but it's not like the ocean, you know. And I don't care what anybody in Florida says. The Gulf is the fucking ocean. It's all connected. So, I you know, I don't care what they say about that. <laughs> um, the major difference too is like is the people really. I mean, everybody that lives in Florida is kind of like a transplant for the most part. I mean, I met a lot of locals too. I'm not saying everybody that's from there. But, uh, you know, everybody's kind of a transplant. So, like, I met people from New York, Texas, California, Arizona, you know, like, just all over the place. New York and Chicago were kind of the most common things, though, out there. Um, also, too, just the the overall atmosphere of, like, when you go out at night and what you do, you know. I mean, it's hard to be pissed off when you wake up in the morning and the beach is, like, 10 minutes away. I mean, it's really hard to be pissed off. <laughs> about that you know um and every single bar that you go to it's not like ridiculously outrageous prices so it's quite alluring to be able to just wake up go to the beach and start the cycle over again you know if money wasn't an option would you move back there oh totally yeah the uh yeah i mean you know yes and no i mean i would have to i would have to make a serious case to try to get back there but um, yeah, I think I think Florida's great. I mean, who knows, though? It might be underwater in a few years. We don't know. So with your music over the last few years, what are some things you've accomplished? I don't know. You know, I mean, it's just... Songwriting for me is just kind of like... It's more of like a... I don't think I use it as therapy, really. You know, I don't think I use it as to, like get out all my feelings or aggression it's almost like i kind of use it more so because like if i don't get it out of my head it'll drive me nuts kind of thing you know i don't really think about it a whole lot but like if a song comes to me or something i'll hear it non-stop until like in my head until i actually write it and put it down you know i try not to put like a whole lot of thought into the entire process you know i mean obviously you want to think about it enough to where it's like okay you know this is this is good this sounds good but at the same point, you know, we just kind of let it, let it happen, let it be, you know. So I don't know. I mean, it's it's never really. It's helped me in a sense, I guess, of like, more so maybe understanding myself, but like in a. In like a background kind of way, because like I don't really notice that stuff until after I listen to the song back mm-hmm. again, you know. So yeah, it's a weird know. process when you like it write is. something down and and you sort of sit on it for a while. Yeah. And then you kind of start to understand it. Like, it's just a bunch of words that sound good together. <laughs> right. And then it sort of, like, comes to life for you. Yeah, totally. And, yeah, that's kind of a bizarre feeling, too. And I think it's it's a unique feeling. So, I don't know, kind of, I guess maybe maybe believe in myself a little bit more than I would have originally thought otherwise. I guess. If I was mm-hmm. just working in a cubicle or some shit. I don't yeah. know. Fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> not for you, huh? No, definitely not. The first song you recorded tonight... Um, it's really new. It's so new that you just finished writing. I mean, you're not really done writing. You're still in the process of writing it. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. I mean, I just, it was, you know, any, any time I've ever been to like a songwriter showcase or like, 
anything that you know I've generally heard on the air and stuff, people would be like, "Oh, the song's like ten years old" or like something like that. And uh, I don't know. I like to think keeping up with the current and like putting out your new stuff is just as good as the old stuff, you know. Spoilers go outside anymore. It's not safe. No way. No way. No way. Pull the covers above my head. Moment I realize I'm not dead. It's not safe. Go away. Don't want to say it again. You want to put your arms around me. Try to make me feel whole. Oh, I love you. Don't you know? But I'm losing myself. Oh, no. Oh, no. I'm still a child. Who feel slightly out of sync I'm not worthwhile At least that's what I feel you think I'm a claustrophobic soul But I'm crawling out of my skin I fucking died today, oh boy, yeah Where have you been? Pointless to seek the light anymore. It's too far away. Tighten the noose around my neck. Maybe I'll just hang. Watch the day fade away. When you put your arms around me, I know I feel cold. Oh, I'll miss you, don't you know? I lost myself Oh no Oh no I'm still a child That feels slightly out of sync I'm not worthwhile At least that's how I feel you think I'm a claustrophobic soul But I'm Crawling out of my skin I fucking died today, oh boy, yeah Where have you been? I'm still the child who feels Slightly out of sync I'm not worthwhile, at least that's How I feel, you think? I'm a claustrophobic soul But I'm Crawling out of my skin I fucking died yesterday, oh boy, yeah Where were you then? Kind of a self-loathing song, really, and I'm not actually that comfortable usually with writing songs like that. Um, You know, because like I said, I don't really use it for therapy or anything like that, so I, I tend to kind of avoid things that are like super personal just because... You know, I'm not saying it's easier that way. It's just that I'm I'm not comfortable with really putting myself out there like that. But um, this one in particular is, you know, it's about just sometimes wanting to fucking off yourself, you know, <laughs> feeling like that. And I think, you know, especially the winter here, the winter here sucks. So that really does a lot, I think, to your psyche, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be interesting to see if this song, if you're still playing the song. Yeah, like if I go back to Florida or something, yeah, or in August. Yeah. You know, like it wouldn't feel right. Like, but right now, you know, anytime you go outside and shit, it's just cold and gross. And, miserable. And you don't see people. Yeah. You're not making that connection with people. And, yeah. I mean, there's just like a lot of shit going on in the world too now, you know, and uh, you don't have that little blanket feeling like you had a while ago. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely so. got the sense of this it was a very lonely song like yeah there's a lot even you talk a lot about like just being alone being afraid yeah being apprehensive and like wanting to like crawl under a blanket and, and be cozy yeah. and be like somewhere familiar yeah um at least then yeah. you know you can handle whatever's around you yeah. yeah definitely being in a safe place um should this become like one of your most popular songs do you think you'll still have that feeling of like I don't like writing personal songs? Do you think that'll influence your songwriting? I don't. I don't really know. You know, uh, could work either way. But I, 
I don't know. I try to just kind of like whatever the whatever the music is. I just try to let it be. You know, I don't I don't like usually concentrate on a topic and be like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna fucking write something cool here. You know, I just I just do it. Yeah. You know, whatever is current in your life and whatever. I think that's when the best music comes out too. And I know it's kind of generic to say that, but like it's true. You know, um, in the movie I'm Not There, you've seen that movie? Yeah. Great movie, right? Great movie. There's uh, there's this one point in particular where a woman's talking to like the really young child, Bob Dylan, and uh, she's like, just write about your own town, child. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I think that's really relevant about. I don't know. You know, everybody writes about girls. Everybody writes about relationships. Everybody writes about teenage angst or whatever. You know, but I think anything you do that's honest, I think that's what makes the song like kind of timeless. Yeah, totally. Because you know, every, everybody can relate to an honest song, really, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Who are some of your big influences coming um, up as far as songwriting went? You mentioned a little bit of listening to, like, the Beatles and the Doors yeah. and some of the classics. Are, anybody more contemporary? Uh, yeah, I like uh, I like what Jack White's doing. Um, I think that what he's doing is... is you know, it's not it's not like it hasn't been done before, but like as far as the music right now, like I said, there was a huge folk scene. We were talking about mm-hmm. it earlier, and like for something like what he did with Lazaretto to be like on the mainstream, you know, I mean, a lot of people could do similar things to that, and a lot of people could have that, but for like him to even have that song on a mainstream thing, it gives the opportunity for like new ideas to kind of come up, which is cool, you know. Um, I like the Black Keys. I like Shaky Graves. He's pretty cool. Shaky Graves is pretty awesome because, you know, I mean, he's from Austin and stuff, and everybody's like, you know, busting their load over Nashville and stuff, but he's from Austin. And so that's cool. Austin's a big music scene. I mean, that's South by Southwest, is there, right? I've been to Nashville, though. I haven't really been to Austin, so I can't speak for that. And I mean, Nashville was cool and stuff, you know? Um, yeah, it was cool. I don't know. There's, I, I like, like, unique artists and stuff. Like, I found myself now more recently, um, more than ever, kind of turning back to. You know, I, when I was growing up in the 90s and stuff, I had mentioned Nirvana and things like that, too, and the whole sub-pop thing and, and all of that. Um, but, you know, like Mud Honey and Fluid and, you know, Nirvana, Fugazi, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, I don't know, that kind of is representing, too, just the overall attitude and feeling I have towards just society right now as well. You know, it's, it's angry in music. It's a lot less polished, and it's, you know, not necessarily angry, I guess, but... It's just less polished, you know. I think there's a lot of glitz and glam nowadays. And do you think that's reflective of culture, or do you think it's just sort of a, a way that music ebbs and flows? Yeah, um, it, everything goes in like the cycle, like that. You know, music is is pretty universal, like that, where it does that. But I think right now in pop culture, especially too, I think a lot of people just concentrate too much on the image instead of the actual music behind it. You know, it's kind of like back in the day when Lennon got in trouble for saying the Beatles are bigger than Jesus, you know, like everybody fucking got up in arms about that, but they still bought Sergeant Pepper, even though they burned, please, please me. You know? Right. right. So I don't know, you know, I think, I think music should be more of like a, like the music should be important. Not really. I mean, also to what the person says and things like that, but like, I don't know, media and stuff takes things out of context and doesn't always accurately. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Portray? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Good collaboration. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. What's your feeling on the media in general? Uh, Helpful for society? Detrimental? Um, do you I think watch a little bit news? of both. Yeah, sometimes. You know, I mean, I mean, I do. I, like, I watch it at least once a day, but um, it's hard, though. You know, I, I gather a lot of my information primarily on the internet because I just... The media and stuff, everybody's got, like, a special interest, you know, everybody's kind of, I mean, like, even magazines, you know, Rolling mm-hmm. Stone or, you know, Enemy or what, whatever, you know, they all got, there's always, like, a special interest and things like that, so I think you can believe what the media says maybe half of the time, maybe, <laughs> you know, I think uh, a lot of times, though, like, everybody's out for a story instead of the truth or facts, you know, they're about what's going to trend on Twitter or what's going to who's going to share this on Facebook and things like that. Yeah. And, you know, that's, it's almost like, I, I don't like it because it's, it's completely just disrespecting the listener in the sense of like, Oh, we feel that we can sway you one way. And so we don't even give you credit for having your own mind kind of thing. You know, 
Yeah, so. it's got to be tough. I mean, I was reading, uh, I think it was Chuck Klosterman. He's a journalist for like Rolling Stone. Yeah. He does a lot of like pop culture writing. And he broke down, you know, when you're, when you're doing a story that has a deadline, right. a lot of times you just go with who calls you back first. Yeah. You know, you kind of put out all these feelers for like all sides of the story. And as a journalist, <laughs> you want to get all sides of the story, but it comes back with like whoever calls you back and has, can kind of give you that line that's going to put you on the front page right. or whatever. So it's tough. I mean, you forget that unfortunately media is a business Yeah, and that just as important as the story it's the the commercials in between right you, know, you kind of have to pay attention to that too yeah yeah i think you can learn a lot just by like listening to the small things that mm-hmm. they say you know kind of making your own story out of it yeah. i guess really and you tackle the media a little bit in your second song you played for us yeah called civil unrest let's give that a listen Got my hands up, man, I've had enough You forgot about me when the going got wrong When you shot from the hip and the questions came later The answers were in forms of gas cans and tasers And I hate all the hatred I see in our hearts Setting buildings ablaze when up and see in the dark So when the media tries to teach you everything that you know Well the true revolutionary didn't die in the road It's a hot bit of unrest that steams in the cold we can't believe everything that we're told Cause most of them souls have already been sold But a true revolutionary can never be young We'll die as a martyr if that's what it takes if you're on the wrong side of history, you'll die with a mistake. It's the crazy people that will call you insane. Oh no, man, no, I'll never break. So this song's about Ferguson, right? Yeah, that was the initial idea behind it. Um, I mean, the opening line, you know, I got my hands up, man, I've had enough. That's that was kind of their anthem. Man. Yeah, totally. Um, did you write it right after that or like while things were going on? While or? it was kind of going down, I mean, I watched, like I would watch the news to see what was really going on. Well, not really going on, but you know what I'm saying. Like mm-hmm. I would to get one side of it. And... Uh, you know, I mean, it really bothered me, actually, too, though, that the media didn't cover that in a more tasteful kind of way. You know, they made it out to be just, I don't know, I think the media is responsible for kind of sending a message, too, and kind of persuading people on how to think. And I don't like the the way, most of the time, that they persuade it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's almost like they're trying to stir shit up. Not and You know, they're not being accurate. They're, like, trying to cover things up or... Yeah. You know, so yeah, I watched it while it was going on and it was, you know, we don't realize it now per se, I think, and maybe it's the same as like people in the 60s, you know, you didn't really realize how big of an impact this will have in like generations to come, you know, and and decades to come, you know, you don't know. Do you think it will? Yeah, I think absolutely, especially when you involve something like race and culture and, 
you know, obviously there's a lot of people pissed off for a lot of different reasons and uh, nobody seems to really be directly acknowledging them, you know, except for the people on the streets. But then again, you know, the mainstream media, the people who are just glued to the fucking TV, you know, are not going to see that because they're not going to cover it. I don't know. I feel like we've had the, like that that situation just keeps playing out. Like you have that the 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 minority getting shot, especially specifically by police. Yeah, where you keep seeing the story over and over again of like police brutality, police taking right. advantage of like you know poor people, right? Um, more specifically, African Americans, but there's been other minorities too, right? I don't know that's so much a lack of coverage as much as like a societal like what do we do about this? Yeah, it's I don't think anybody really has a fucking clue about how. You know, to to really handle it. I mean, we were talking about it earlier and stuff, and like you know, in the in police officers' defense, you know, I'm not saying in the Ferguson situation or you know the most recent one in California, right? It was California, Los Angeles, Los Angeles, yeah, think, the yeah. homeless guy, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not saying I'm you know that's not right. I'm not you know for that, but like well, anytime the the tension gets built and it's a hostile environment, people are prone to act all sorts of ways. You know, I mean, because then you got the American public now and like a lot of stuff on the Internet. Internet now, too, is like a big source for people's news and like mm-hmm. all of that, you know. And uh, I don't know, anytime you perpetuate one uh, side of it and then the other side's obviously, you know, Einstein, every action equal opposite reaction. You start talking one way about this way, it's going to spark the other side to talk about it the other way. And once, I don't know, I don't, I don't know. It kind of seems like. I don't know, man. I I just, I don't know that if like the tension is becoming worse because of the way that the media outlets are covering it or the way that like, I mean, you have fucking polls. Like I watched, I watched this thing on ISIS, for example, and it was, somebody had posted it on Facebook and it was like ISIS beheads 21 people or 24 people or something like that. And I was like watching this video of the news report, but before the fucking news report came on, there was an advertisement for like Jimmy John's or something. And I was just like, (laughs) what the fuck is, what is going on here, you know? Or, like, anything important. There's always these ads now prior to it. And it's it's funny, though, when you see something. Not funny, like, the, the circumstance, but it's funny when you see an ad for, like, Red Lobster or something before you see, like, oh, 10 people murdered today and mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. It's like it's no big deal. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's almost like it's coming off that way. And There's a great book that I read that... um Roger Waters actually made an album based on like the premise of it called Amused to Death. All right. Um, it was written in the 80s and like completely culturally relevant to like exactly what you're talking about. I think the author called it Now This Reporting. Okay. Where like you get this like little snippet of information and then before you have a chance to like process it or kind of think about like <laughs> what the implications could be or like what the other side could be, <laughs> bam, there's another thing, yeah. bam, there's another thing. Yeah. Just to kind of keep you engaged so they can hold... I mean, because they have to hold you till the next right. commercial. Well, yeah, I mean, the attention span of, of people that are, you know, even our age... I'm 30. I mean, you know, I don't know. I don't Same know. age, yeah. It's like, it's fucking appalling. It's pathetic, man. <laughs> it's like, can't sit there for more than five minutes without, like, checking your phone or, like... Mm-hmm. I don't know. You know, checking your email, calling somebody, texting. Oh, what the fuck are you doing, you know? Yeah. I remember when I was younger, man, you want to get a hold of somebody, you just walk over to their house, knock on the door. You know, we've all seen the Facebook memes and everything like yeah. that. Or, But that's, I mean, that's there was something pretty in that kind of culture where you still actually had to, like, have that personal connection. You know, it's not, like, it's cheesy as well to say social media is just making it more antisocial, but it's true, you know? Now, we're leading that to music. Huh? Every band, every artist has a Facebook page with thousands of fans. They're, you know, people have more access to music than ever before. People are posting songs instantly on SoundCloud. Right. Do you see that as a positive thing for the industry or a negative thing? Um, I don't know. fuck Facebook in the face, man. I don't. Know. <laughs> uh, you know, I see it. I see it as, uh, you know, it's great and all to get the music out there. It's cool. Like, you're getting your music up and stuff, you know, and it's it's cool. It's an outlet. It's, like, to get your music heard, you know, and to, to a lot of people that matters, you know, on the on the social media. Um, but, like, if you're into playing live shows and you're into, like, actually making a real, like, personal connection, I think that the only way to do that is just playing out and, like, to get people to your shows and stuff. I mean, especially because Facebook now and YouTube and all that shit. Have you seen any of that going on? 
where they were like talking about taking independent artists off or like charging you to like I reach did a fan see base. That. Yeah. It's bullshit. You know, I mean, so the, I mean, the only way to do it is just get out there and promote and like hand out flyers and get a street team, like, you know. So you think the old old method is still yeah relevant? yeah always I mean it's like uh, you know it's like you get like a nineteen fifties Chevy or something it's it's great you know but you you buy a Chevy or something from two thousand and ten and it's horseshit <laughs> I don't know it's just there used to be like a certain pride and a certain quality and like what people did for work and like what they did just their job and like musicians were not really that different like we still have to have a certain pride in it and i don't want to be as antisocial and impersonal as just being on the internet you know yeah it's weird um i found that musicians are the worst at self-promotion when it comes to face-to-face well it's it's contradictory you know to what i mean we're most musicians and most people who make music are like on a deeper level kind of thing you know they want to I mean, they're talking about their feelings and mm-hmm. all that bullshit. You know? And there's a certain cheapening of of your art, I guess, when you start inviting people to shows. I guess where like the 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 commerce comes into it, right? Where it's like, hey, I have this this album that I poured my my heart and soul into right. it. Do you want it in exchange for five dollars? Right. And I, I just hate it though too how they're uh, everybody always is talking all those like bullshit things you see on the net about. Uh, you know, like, oh, if you want to sell albums and you want to do this, you need to check this out. It's like you're taking advice from some guy with a fucking Michael Bolton haircut. You know, it's, it, uh, it bothers me, man. You know, like, yeah. it, like it obviously bothers you, too. It's mm-hmm. extremely impersonal. And uh, it's just it's a cop out way to, like, not really get into what you're doing, you know, and not it's I don't know. It's almost it's almost like you're not believing in what you're doing when you're not willing to talk personally to people and do that, you know. Well, you're going to get a chance to do a lot of self-promotion, a lot of interacting with people over the next mm-hmm. couple months. You've got an album coming out yeah. in May, you're yeah. thinking? Yeah, May. I think May 1st is the date we're looking at. You've got everything just about recorded. You yeah. Know, mentioned that you're going to... A couple of bass tracks, and then we're cool. Um, J.R. Hank from Legendary Recorders. He's the one that's been recording it. Sounds great. Legendary is right here in the city. Um, Grand in Sacramento, 3441 West Grand Avenue. Nice plug. Ooh, like shout out. <laughs> <laughs> How yeah, you feeling about cool. it? I, yeah, I feel great about it. Um, what I really enjoy though is like the local scene now. Like we were talking earlier about how um, a lot where I'm from, especially in the suburbs, like we all go to the same open mics all the time. We're always there every single week. We've all been playing with each other, and so all of our influences and, and our styles are kind of rubbing off on each other, which is really cool. Um, there's a studio out in the suburbs called Populous Recording. Um, James Scott is the uh, head producer and engineer over there. He owns it. Um, a lot of the guys out in the suburbs are recording there, you know, because it's like literally five minutes away from where we all live, you know. Um, so it's cool to to hear all the influences kind of melding together, but like at the same point, everybody's developing their own style. So there's a lot of really cool albums coming out. Aaron Williams and Mike Hayes have a, an album coming out called X Files. It's going to be pretty cool. Um, EX Files, you know, so for like ex-girlfriends nice. and stuff. Yeah, I mean, you know, we all got them. Yeah. Um, and then I know North of Eight's trying to get back in the studio. It's a band I went on tour with. And then uh, Jeff Matson too, is coming out with an album, which is going to be really good. So, and then mine is coming out, so. Man, there's like a whole western suburbs Dude, scene. Western suburbs are popping right now, man. Everyone's got money out it's there. The new Seattle. Well, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> all, all of us are still fucking broke, but you know. The those other guys are they're a lot more working than I am right now. So So you're self producing this album. You're gonna be self promoting it. Yep. Doing well, I mean JR you rates. know, JR Hank too is doing the production on it as well, but yeah, I mean once it's in your hands, though, it's it's completely on you. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, for the most part. I mean, we're kind of, we're working on something now where it's going to be kind of an equal thing. Because, you know, you put in equal amount of effort recording it as I did, you know, recording it and writing it and whatever. So, like, I don't know. Things in the music industry need to change. And one of them is that whole fairness factor again, you know. I mean, so studio time sometimes is just ridiculously expensive to the point where... You know, you have all these great artists, but like they care so much about their art that that's what they want to do all the time. But they work a job that doesn't pay them enough money to like pay for three hundred dollars for half a day of recording. Mm-hmm. You know, and and Jr. and I have kind of worked something out where Legendary has been very nice to me, and all the guys that work there, Mike Corcoran from Deals Gone Bad, and all of them, they're all producers over there as well. So, but yeah, I mean, he puts in fifty percent of the work, I put in the other fifty, and we just kind of. Do deal with that accordingly. 
Yeah. You know, I mean, obviously that's not like a common standard <laughs> practice, but you know, that's, that's what it works. And it, there's a lot of trust built into that. Yeah. I've known JR for a while. We've, you know, we've been, been through hell and back, came to a couple of your open mic things, mm-hmm. you know, so that was cool. Yeah, the one in Natalie's place was out of control. <laughs> it was. I'm hoping to get those those stars again this year. Just yeah. You were saying at the end of the month, maybe, right? Possibly. Probably. Maybe not this month, but soon. 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 I'm feeling it. Wait till it's warmer. Yeah. It's, yeah. You, know. you know what it is? It's because we had the one in August. Mm-hmm. And it was so fucking hot in here. Yeah. I mean, like, the, <laughs> everyone, like, playing was just dripping sweat. Yeah. That I was like, well, not when it's, it's cold, but now it's too cold. So I got to yeah. find that, like, happy medium ground. Yeah. We'll get back there. I, yeah, I should have taken uh, Ross Berman's um, style that night. You know, he was wearing a, uh, oh, what the fuck was that band? He was wearing some shirt, and Brian, my buddy Brian commented on it. It was called uh, Dashboard Confessional. That's yeah. what it was. <laughs> he was wearing, like, a cutoff Dashboard Confessional shirt. I don't know. I played with him, actually, not too long ago. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I was, Gallery Cabaret. I tried making it. It was a weekend show, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was no, like a, was it? I don't it was know. Like a Friday or a Saturday? Yeah, I think it was, yeah. actually. Yeah. Um, Jamie put it on. Jamie from uh, Strobe Studios. Jamie Wagner. Yeah. Also a very good producer as well. You should check out Strobe Studios, man. I've heard a lot of things. I, actually, almost everyone I've talked to has had something good to say about Strobe. They it's do like really a, cool. Um, like a like a contest thing, don't they? Where they have an open mic and then you get like four free recording yeah. hours. Yeah, you get like four hours of recording time. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, and they're great over there too. I mean, Jamie's really lax and like he's real quick with what he does. Like you know, he's very cool. Um, Hannah Frank actually was the one that kind of turned me onto that, and I think she's playing at main stage in like a week or something, or like nice. two weeks. Yeah. So she also hosts that uh, Act One Sing for Your Supper thing, which is cool. Mm. And she worked sound at the IPO festival last year. It's coming up in April, so I'll be there. I'll be there for that. So cool. International pop overthrow. It's David Bash. So you've got a pretty good network of people. In yeah, city. yeah. I was fortunate, man. I got to uh, meet a lot of cool people, and they just, you know, they seem to like what I do. I, I like how they conduct themselves too. So it seems cool. It's a good network. There, you know. I mean, I, I'm fortunate though to to know those people though, because. You know, being having been in the scene for a while and like deeper and deeper is like there's a lot of bullshit sometimes. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of fakeness sometimes, a lot of ass kissing. And uh, I fortunately, I I didn't meet yes people. I met like people who are actually serious about what the fuck they do. You know, so that was cool. You're coming off of being on a recording <laughs> label. Yeah. Well, how did you get signed to a label? Because I think that's a lot of people like that's their goal when they play music is to like get signed right you know have have somebody else kind of take care of the grunt work for them yeah how did that happen for you uh actually it it happened i was playing an open mic out in the suburbs and uh you know he just he kind of saw me and then after it was kind of one of those things you would see in a movie where it was like you know i was playing and i was doing my thing and i think i had a looper pedal at the time or something so like i was trying to play songs that you could like see the structure of it, you know, and all I was just wanting was a recording studio. I was just like, I need to do this. And, uh, but that wasn't the goal by going and playing. I just was going to play. But yeah, he saw me there. And then after I walked off, he just kind of gave me his card and he was like, okay, <laughs> well, I guess, I guess I will call you record label. <laughs> call you the next day. What kind of things does a record label do for an artist? Um, it, they do a lot, like all, a lot of the social media work and stuff like that. You know, they're they're really good at like making the connections for um, like the next level. You know what I'm saying? Like for artists, it's really hard to kind of call a venue or like to get a hold of a venue and just try to book it on your own and like do things like that. But record labels are good for the sense that, you know, they're, they're able to call as a representative for the artist, which, and you know, psychologically it's it seems... Uh, at a different level you know what I'm saying so it, it just seems like it's easier to get into festivals and things like that also too you know if you're on a label and stuff um, it was cool that you know they had worked out a deal with some you know the artists and stuff where it was uh, you know you get free recording time kind of in a sense it's not free but like you know they're not they're not giving you an advance and then you know taking all of your royalties and things like that you know it's just you you guys are in it for an effort and uh, the same kind of idea and goal, and that's kind of how it works on that end. I don't know if that's the case with all labels. You know, I'm just. Speaking. I mean, that seems that seems fairly typical. Yeah. Um, the certain obligations need to be met on on both sides. Right. Would you recommend it after going through that? To yeah, the yeah. I mean, like I said, it works. It works for some people. I mean, me personally, you know, I just. Uh, 
I just have a, a different artistic view, I think. You know, I think for, for most, a lot of people, though, it works really well, you know, like if we're in that kind of setting, you know, like if, if that's what you want, you know, it'll work for you. But I, uh, I kind of have my own ideas on things I want to do. If you could start a record label, would you? Oh, no. No, <laughs> no. no, no way. No, certainly not. <laughs> you like doing stuff more grassroots DIY. Yeah, I'm just it like it's, when this album is done, we're just looking for a distribution deal. I'm not even gonna bother trying to get a recording contract next time. <laughs> Fuck that. <laughs> yep, not going through that again. So, but it, it was a pleasant experience. Uh, well, let's listen to the last song that you played. Cool. I see you waiting, maybe you're catching a train But it's not at the station, it's coming later That's no reason for you to run away That car got derailed some time ago Left a kind of scene that puts a chill in your bones It'll rattle your teeth when it's not you and it's not me Last by all those looking glass ties Through your pretty blue eyes To the pretty blue skies Near the pretty blue lights That's where I'll be Well if your train no ride Then your plane won't fly Left as a monkey with the rubber mind Mysterious and curious Yes oh George Oh oh Mr. Wilson I hear you say Baby, that's quite the tale Forget the cough, just give me the nails And that's not a very nice thing to say Starlight, star bright, asphalt and sunshine It's blinding my eyes, it's warping my mind Oh no, you don't own me Well if your train no ride, well then your plane won't fly Left as a monkey with the rubber mind Mysterious and curious, yes, so oh, Joe Oh, oh, Mr. Wilson I hear you saying that, baby, that's quite a tale Forget the cough and now give me the nails And that's not a very nice thing to say I see you waiting, maybe you're catching the train it's not at the station, it's coming later Oh, you don't own me So if your train don't ride, well then your plane won't fly You're left as a monkey with the rubber mind Mysterious and curious, you're so George Oh, oh, Mr. Wilson Does this one have a title? Uh, what one was it? Oh, yeah, no, it was, uh, it did, but I, I forgot. I just came up with it, but I forgot. To be determined. To be determined, yeah, I guess. It's not very professional, is it? It's all right. <laughs> follow, follow Mike on, on Facebook, and he'll post what the title is eventually. <laughs> there you go. It's kind of cool, though, because, like, people get to, to see a snapshot of the song as it is right now. Yeah, it's, it's hard for me with titles, man. I don't, because, I don't know. You know, it's like, do you want to try to be, like, mysterious and be like, oh, it's called like magnet holder or something you know or do you just want to call it like i see you waiting you know that could be the name yeah of it. yeah i you guess know? i never thought about that no <laughs> totally because that's like the first impression yeah that people get of the song it's like right. even the title and it either turns them off or like intrigues them i need to put more thought into my titles i guess <laughs> i don't know man i usually just go with the word that i use the most <laughs> right, yeah that's we'll... uh that seems to be the like the the pop uh model yeah yeah one line that stuck out in the song was the oh oh mr wilson yeah bit of a beatles ripoff yeah a little bit you know intentionally uh, homage, though homage. oh yeah totally not that I mean, an, an homage not a not a ripoff yeah totally like uh yeah that wasn't i i didn't just like subconsciously come up with that or anything yeah, yeah. it was that was intentional we were i was sitting around in my house one day and uh curious george was on tv and shit and uh there's this one part where it said, uh, oh, if you're, you know, he had said something about, well, the plane can't fly if we don't get there on the train or something because the train's not riding or something like that, you know? And so I just kind of put those together. And then it just got me thinking about, 
you know, George Harrison, rubber, rubber mind with the monkey. And then it was curious George. I mean, there's like a, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a little, my mind's fucked up sometimes. So, but yeah, it was, it was a reference to the, to the Beatles. Um, it's kind of got like a, like a surf pop or like a, like an early rock and roll <laughs> feel to it. Cool. Um, do you have a lot of songs that are kind of upbeat like that or is most of your stuff more laid back? And- yeah. Um, it, I think it's about half, you know, um, when, it, when I first, you know, had signed with the record label and all that, it was more of like a laid back folk thing, you know, but recently just, you know, my, my current thoughts about the music business and, you know, society and things like that, it's just subconsciously becoming more like quicker and you know a little more aggressive kind of thing you mm-hmm. know and i mean my dad even said to me too like when i was playing this stuff a couple of months ago he was like you need something that's a little more upbeat you know because he comes from that era uh-huh. you know he doesn't want to hear like oh, i'm a cree and i don't want to hear that he wants to hear you know some rockabilly type of shit yeah someone get your feet moving which would be great if people actually got their feet moving. But, like, yeah, people don't do the, anything at shows. I know. Like, I'm seriously, like, really mad at the fact that, like, I haven't seen anybody crowd surf in, like, a long time. Or, like, even a mosh pit. I mean, I went to the AM Taxi show. That, so, yeah, so that's not true. I went to the AM Taxi show at the Brower House a couple of weeks ago. And that was awesome. Um, there was people moshing still in every... I mean, they drew probably, like, 150, 160 people to the Brower House. And I don't know if you've ever been to the Brower House no. in, in Lombard. But, yeah, it's... 150 people like pack that place <laughs> you know but that was cool though it seems like almost like too that the punk scene i mean i haven't been around a whole lot of punk shows or anything but i'm re- i'm now starting to get back into that but it almost seems like those kinds of crowds really don't hesitate to like feel the music and go nuts you know mm-hmm. seems like a lot of the folk scene is more like oh i'm gonna put my phone up and i'm gonna record this and, yeah <sighs> I feel like such an old man, but yeah, it drives me crazy. It's just like, dude, watch the performance. Like, Mm -hmm. have an experience. Yeah, you know, and I think that's why a lot of the performers, like the mainstream guys, are like so insistent about people not taking photos and not doing that. I mean, it's one thing because then, like, how are you supposed to say, like, oh, I don't want to get out there and like have people share about me and stuff like that? You know, because it's not about the money at all. It's just more of less like. You know, you paid to be here. Like, so why are you watching the concert through your phone? Yeah, and you know? it seems like the people that get most frustrated about that kind of stuff are people that are like the the musicians that used to go to a lot of shows. Yeah, where like, they like, it's almost like a like an elder telling you like this isn't how you should live your life. Yeah, like where it's like you're missing out on an experience. Like, yeah. put your phone down, dance, do something Seriously. like active, experience this. Because like a lot of times too, when you're filming a show or something like that, like then a text will pop up, and then you'll like go to the text, and then you'll miss like something really cool that the person did, and it's it's super disrespectful, I think too, to just like I mean discredit somebody that's on stage. Like not everybody gets on, not everybody can get on stage and like perform material that they've thought of and done you know i mean everybody can do it but like the people who do it well especially you gotta like give credit to that Mm. you know don't Mm -hmm. don't just dismiss it by like being like oh my phone's more important kind of thing we're getting old man we are getting old man fucking dirty man (laughs) fucking billy graham (laughs) (laughs) sitting around grumbling about these kids these days yeah i know yeah it really doesn't make sense to me though and i i feel like weird saying it like that but yeah the the kids nowadays i think that the kids the generation that's previous to us i i'm not sure i'm not sure about that but i think that the younger people are starting to get wiser you know i think that they're like starting to catch on to these things but uh you know it's fucked up to think that the 90s is like vintage music yeah you know what i'm saying the 90s is like old school Uh Uh uh-huh yeah it's sad it is sad, but I don't know. There was a great time in music, though, in the early '90s. So yeah, I and I mean, I'm sure people are going to look back on like now and and be able to pick out some great stuff and get nostalgic yeah. about it. And yeah, whatever. It's just when you're in it, it's it's tough to see the forest through the trees. Yeah, chains. that's kind of yeah, that's kind of what I was getting at with like you know when we were talking about uh, civil unrest and all that. Yeah, that song. So yeah, it's it's hard, but I don't know. I'm just gonna keep making music though. Just keep on rolling. Put it out there. Something's gonna happen to it. Totally, man. So, what are some of your goals for this year? You're gonna put out the album. You're gonna have your CD release show at Double Door, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, we're still. I'm just waiting on a confirmation. And that's with the band, right? It's not just you. You've got the guys that are recording with you are gonna come. Yep. And play the show with you. So, full band with you. Yeah, I got uh, Matt Seneca from North of Eight. He's the drummer. Um, Ray DiGiulio, who plays lead guitar for North of Eight. 
um, Mike Hayes. I'm I'm pretty sure he's playing. I think he you know is going to do some rhythm stuff with me. Um, but he's from the Trust, and then he's also got his own his own thing coming out too. And then uh, Max Matter, he plays like keys and saxophone, but he's going to primarily be doing the keys because you know the album. We're going to play the entire album all the way through, kind of without stopping. So. And are you guys going to have openers like other bands playing with you, or is it just going to be yeah. you guys? Yeah, no, we're going to have a couple other bands on the bill. So I'll uh, I'll have to get back to you and let you know. Buddies from like the West suburbs. Uh, kind I mean, take, kind of take them with you when you come to the city. Yeah, I mean, you know, what kind of what what we'd like to do as well is to, like play with like local bands here in the city. You know, I mean, because we're from the suburbs, so mm-hmm. it's like, I mean, yeah, we can draw a crowd out, but if you have three of the same bands on the bill together, they all just draw the same crowd, so it's, True. you know, so we're do- you're trying to branch out there and play with some bands that we've never played with before and check it out. Well, I'm sure we're going to get some people from this podcast that are going to listen to you and want to check you out later cool. on. Yeah, I hope so. Man. Be fun. Where can they find you online? Uh, just dude, My Facebook page is Mike McKenna. Well, thanks for sitting down tonight. Thank you Appreciate very much. You. This has been a pleasure. Driving out and- yeah and recording um do you have any advice for people that are getting into this whole singer songwriter thing anything like that you would have done differently nah i mean you just you're never really gonna know what the fuck you're doing just Just roll with it just roll with it man don't think about it too much solid yeah (laughs) michael thanks so much for coming out tonight cheers cheers and thanks for bringing a six pack. Yeah, Strongly encouraged. PBR. Any, any any podcast. PBR, uh, wonderfully delicious local <laughs> homemade fruit. Not local, but ish. Yeah. I mean Midwest. Ish. Yeah. But yeah. Feel free to bring beers over. Um, definitely loosens things up a little bit. Yeah. I'm like, I look forward to hearing your music. Thank checking you, out Chris. your show in May. Thank you again, man. Yeah, you're gonna be on the list for sure. So make sure yeah. you're there. All right. Cool. Hey podcast listeners, Chris Dever here. I'd hate to think you're missing out on any new episodes of this podcast. So make sure you hit subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or anywhere else you're getting your podcast fix. New episodes are posted twice a month and I'm always looking for new people to interview. If you're interested in being interviewed for the podcast, shoot me an email at chicagosingersongwriterpodcast at gmail.com. For all the latest updates, follow me on Facebook, Chicago Singer Songwriter Podcast, or on Twitter at Shy SS Podcast. Keep listening, keep writing, and keep playing Chicago.